Thank you. We're going to go straight into our uh, panel discussion. So I'd like to invite our, our panelists to come up and um, take their places. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our sponsors of today's event and many of our research programs that include um, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Exxon, Dogmec, and the Asian Development Bank. Um, we really wouldn't be able to conduct the wide array of activities that we do without them, and they also are very generous with their expertise and helping us to shape the substance of the program. Um, it's now my pleasure to also um, introduce Michael Kugelman uh, from the Woodrow Wilson Center. So we've had the, the great pleasure of partnering with the Woodrow Wilson Center for three years in a row on our energy research program. Um, and it's been a terrific partnership, um, both in terms of the events, but also allowing us to access the tremendous expertise that the Woodrow Wilson has on these issues. Um, and Michael, in particular, uh, who's a program associate, was a user of deep values in Asia, particularly India and Pakistan. I believe many of you know him um, from his remarks in major media publications at the New York Times and National Geographic. And, and we're very grateful to him for his leadership and partnership. So um, please join me in welcoming Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think that the uh, congressman remarks have set a great token for the uh, for this morning's discussion. Again, my name is Michael Kubelman. I'm the South and Southeast Asia uh, Associate at the Wilson Center, uh, proud co-host of the uh, this morning's launch. As Mary was saying, the Wilson Center and NBR have had numerous successful collaborations uh, in recent years, and it's always a pleasure to work with organizations top notch at NBR. Um, let me just take a very brief moment to say something about the Wilson Center. We are the official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, the only U.S. president to have held a PhD, and for that reason our mission is to bridge the gap between policy and academia, and this is done through the production of research, scholarship, uh, programming, and publications on issues of policy import. We have several, several dozen regional and tropical departments and a variety of staff and scholar experts uh, the country the world of policy, academia, business, and journalism, to name just a few fields. And a bit later this morning, we'll be hearing from our president, Jane Harmon, who will probably say a bit more about us. The center focuses on issues of policy import, and the subject of energy demand in Asia clearly uh, meets that criteria. As you know, in Asia, a variety of factors, including economic growth and demographic trends, have sent energy demand soaring, and particularly for overseas oil and gas. Just to take South Asia, my main region of focus, two-thirds of India's oil consumption presently comes from overseas, according to the International Energy Agency. And that's expected to increase 90% by 2030. Pakistan, meanwhile, estimates that it will run out, it will have run out of indigenous oil and gas supplies in less than 20 years. And of course, this dynamic is reflected elsewhere in Asia, and the U.S. government's uh, pivot to Asia will heighten for Washington and others the uh, policy implications of the region's rising energy demand. So with no further ado, I'll now introduce the chair uh, of this panel. It seems that whenever you hear the terms Asia and energy, you know you'll be hearing the name uh, Mike Kerber. He currently wears two hats uh, as both the research director of NBR's energy security program and also a senior lecturer on international and Asian energy at UC San Diego. He also had a long career in the oil industry, where he held several positions with ARCO, including Director for Global Energy and Economics. I think a few people are informed as he is uh, on these issues, so I think, or I know that our panel is in very good hands, so Mike, I now turn things over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. Uh, I'll just, I think, work from, work from the table here rather than stand up and uh, Go up and down, up and down as a group, kind of, kind of uh, jack in the box. Um, Michael was kind enough to serve on one of our panels at the conference, uh, talking about India, India's national oil company that developments for GC and others. And uh, Michael has established himself as a real a powerhouse on South Asian uh, issues, energy issues, energy security issues. So thank you very much. Uh, we've got. 
three panelists with us today. Uh, and what, I, what I'll do is provide a brief overview of the report, some of our basic conclusions and, and questions that are raised in the report, because uh, particularly the first, the first part, there are fewer answers than there are questions generated by, by uh, uh, that section. But we've got uh, three really uh, uh, wonderful people here today to, to, uh, to really uh, add to the discussion. Ed Chow is a senior fellow with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, has a long pedigree, a, a little bit like, um, like mine, spent many years in the oil industry, uh, and is a, a well-known consultant on uh, particularly Central Asia, Caspian, uh, Russian, uh, energy issues, but has a, a wide range of uh, expertise uh, on these issues. He just told me he just flew back from Islamabad yesterday, so we, <laughs> we got him back just in time for the meeting. Uh, to my left is Chandar from the World Bank. A I'm sorry, the Asian Development Bank, yes. Uh, and uh, he's got a terrific uh, range of experience, particularly in development of alternative energy sources, renewables, uh, we've asked him to talk a little bit today about uh, how he perceives leaderships in Asia, South Asia, uh, their perception of their energy security challenges uh, a bit and, and, uh, from the ADB perspective. Uh, and then we've got Erica Downs, who is uh, with the Brookings Institution. Uh, she's the go-to person when it comes to talk about Chinese national oil companies, Chinese energy policy. She's written a, a, a whole range of... Uh, really important works on those issues. Uh, so if you would be interested in that question, Eric is the person to, to read and talk to, and it's terrific to get her here today. But to provide a little color on, on how the Chinese uh, are approaching this around sanctions issue, a little more specifics, uh, and her sense of how, how the leadership is thinking about handling what is for them a very difficult predicament, a really difficult trade-off. Uh, in the policy uh, towards the land, oil sanctions, uh, and that, the relationship with that with their relationship with the U.S. This was the eighth uh, annual workshop that we've done. Uh, so we've, uh, we've had a long uh, history of these. We've done the Middle East Asia Energy Connection session. Uh, we've looked at Russian Asia Energy Connections and Geopolitics uh, in another session. Uh, a couple of years ago, we looked at Asian, the geopolitics of uh, Asian uh, oil and gas pipelines, which is a, uh, a, I think brings out all the different geopolitical dimensions of how each of the countries in the region are trying to meet their energy security uh, needs. So what we decided to focus here was to focus very specifically on the oil and gas issue. And of course, this is driven by the obvious of massive increase in, in oil demand uh, in Asia uh, and natural gas. But I mean, for, for some, uh, I mean, Asia has accounted for 80 percent plus of the increase in oil demand globally over the last decade or two. Uh, if you look outward, the IEA forecast has a global increase in demand of about 12 million barrels a day over the next 20 years. Uh, virtually all of that is going to come from developing Asia. Uh, so it's, it, they loom extremely large in the, in the global oil and gas balance. Uh, all of that oil will, become, will be imported from outside the region, all that incremental demand. The region already depends on its imports for 70% of its oil needs overall and 100%, maybe 100%. Uh, and they're facing a very changing global oil market and a changing regional Asian natural gas and, and, and uh, ONG market. So we wanted to look at how Asia is responding to those uh, issues, how important Asia has become to the geopolitics of oil, uh, because it's become such a huge uh, force in the demand side and the largest, by far the largest buyer of oil, uh, particularly from the first world. And look at the implications for the U.S. Uh, and U.S.-Chinese relations uh, in, in, in some cases. So we look at four issues. Uh, first, the shifting pattern of global oil demand uh, and the how Asia has now become virtually the demand sink for, for Persian Gulf oil, Middle East oil, and a shift, a complete shift in the axis of 
global oil market onto a Middle East Asia axis. Uh, and what are the implications, particularly for the U.S., uh, and, and I'll elaborate a bit on that in a minute. Second, an example of how important Asia has become in the geopolitics of the Persian Gulf as the largest buyers. Uh, and, and the case study really is the Iran, U.S. Iran oil sanctions efforts. Uh, and, and the fact that the U.S. simply cannot achieve its objectives of sanctioning uh, U.S. or Iranian oil exports without the cooperation of the Asian countries because they now are the large buyers. Uh, the Europeans have been able to reduce uh, their imports, but it's not that large. It's all about Asia. Uh, so the U.S. needs Asian cooperation to meet its objectives in the region. Uh, third, to look at the, the rise of the Asian national oil companies uh, and this push to, 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 to gain physical ownership, equity control over oil and gas supplies, what does that mean? Does that really enhance uh, Chinese, Japanese energy security? And does it undermine our energy security? Because there's a lot of perception that somehow they're taking oil off the market, undermining our access to future oil supplies. Uh, and uh, so we wanted to look at that issue. Is that real or is it a limit? Uh, and fourth, the LNG market in Asia, which is becoming a critically important part of the Asian energy mix. Gas demand, natural gas demand is booming. The LNG market is booming in Asia. Uh, you have the demand shock that's really been caused by the Japanese uh, Fukushima incident, the decline in nuclear, a huge jump in Japanese LNG purchases and really administered a banana shock to the age of the LNG market. What does this mean? In the context as well of US, potential U.S. LNG exports, which Congressman Prusani talked about, I think, are very, uh, very crisp. Uh, so let me just highlight some of the, some of the pieces of that, uh, and then we'll open it up for our panelists to talk about a piece of this, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions and, uh, and, and hopefully discussion. We should have lots of brain power horsepower in the room to, uh, to have a good discussion, uh, I, I would think. Uh, first, th this shift in global oil flows. We have John Mitchell from Chatham House, uh, read a paper, John Alderman, uh, from a Middle East perspective on the panel to this. Uh, what, it, what does that mean? The foundation of, a foundation of U.S. commitment to the Persian Gulf, strategic commitment, blood and treasure over the last 30 years. Uh, and I've been in the oil industry long enough to see a lot of, a lot of that uh, as, as it has any impacts on the market. Uh, has been ensuring the security of oil flows from the Gulf. So the, the most leveraging piece of the global oil market. And this made sense in, in, in the 70s and 80s when the U.S., Europe, Japan were the big buyers of Gulf oil. Uh, the U.S. has typically gotten 15 to 30 percent of its oil imports from the Persian Gulf, not, not nearly as big a share as, as the European, but the Gulf has been an important part, uh, historically, of the U.S. oil supply picture. But all of that's changed. Uh, Asia now accounts for virtually all the buying, incremental buying of Gulf oil, which I mentioned before. Uh, U.S. demand is looks pretty flattish over time. Production is rising, and we have a lot of discussion about how uh, North America is heading to go quasi self-sufficient in, in oil supplies when you add in rising Canadian heavy oil production uh, and rising tight oil production. The U.S. has been the largest incremental growth in, in global oil supply over the last three years outside of OPEC. It's added 1.2 million barrels a day to production. And this is after a 30 years of structural decline in U.S. oil production, uh, of, of uh, consistent structural decline. So it's a stunning reversal of the previous trend. So U.S. demand for imported oil is likely to, to decline as we see flat demand in rising production. Uh, you're going to see the same thing in, in largely in Europe with declining demand uh, for oil that about at the pace of declining production. Uh, which means their demand can be met largely by Russian supplies, Central Asian supplies, North Africa, and West, West Africa. Uh, so Asia is it. And this is also looking at it from the Gulf towards the marketplace. They're seeing the same thing. Our future market uh, is Asia. Uh, 
Asia is now geopolitically, when you think about it, the du- most direct beneficiary of secured flows of oil from the Gulf. It's the most directly exposed to physical disruption uh, to supply in the Gulf. Um, so, who should be guarding sea lanes? Who should be committed to the security and stability of the Gulf when the U.S. is now the prime strategic power in the Gulf, but the direct beneficiary is Asia? And so the question is, how long and under what conditions will the U.S. be willing and able to continue its, uh, its deep, costly, strategic commitment to the Gulf as this sense of oil supply, self-sufficiency, uh, abundance sets in here in Congress uh, and elsewhere. At the same time, the U.S. has a vital interest in what happens to Gulf supply because that drives the oil price. It's set in the global market. Our oil prices are not set by whether we get oil from the Gulf, but by the global oil market. A disruption in the Gulf is high prices for everybody. So we still have a deep, vital interest in that stable flow of the Gulf, of oil from the Gulf. But the foundations are shifting. And so really we, we have more questions than answers to this uh, of how the debate here in Washington will evolve. You put that in the context of uh, wanting to pivot more resources towards Asia. You have a war-weary public uh, here in the U.S. with Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, little interest in taking on new ventures, strategic ventures uh, in, in the Gulf. Uh, defense budget cuts, moving some tough priorities and choices on uh, strategic commitments to the Gulf. You put all that together with a very different oil market uh, picture strategically, uh, how will all that play out in the U.S. commitment to the Gulf? And what does that mean for the free riders, the Chinese in particular, who are free riding on U.S strategic costs and commitments to the Gulf. Uh, traditionally, it's been the Japanese Koreans who are strategic allies. This was all part of the, uh, uh, the bargain. But with China taking its role as the largest buyer of Gulf oil now, uh, what should China's role be in providing security in those sea lanes and flows in the Gulf? <coughs> Does the U.S. want China involved in the Gulf and in the sea lane? If we do or don't, uh, under what conditions do we dealt with? Uh, so the, ch- the rise of the Chinese consumption and, and uh, this 800-pound gorilla market really matters uh, and makes these uh, choices for the U.S. a lot more complicated uh, and a lot more difficult. Uh, so that, those are the questions that we raise really more than answers. I'm going to ask Ed to ruminate a bit on this based on, on his experience. I'll expect you to answer that question when we, when we get to you. Uh, the second, this, this, and this kind of led to the second discussion, which was on the Iranian oil sanctions issue. Uh, as I said, I think this is a case that shows how important Asia now is in the U.S. efforts to achieve its goals uh, in the Gulf. And what we were trying to get at was what are the different perceptions of each of the key Asian players, the Chinese, the Indians, the Japanese, and the Koreans. And we had people on the panel talk about each of those uh, perceptions, but in particular on China, since China was uh, very large in that picture as the largest buyer of Durami uh, and with a different, obviously, strategic relationship. Uh, and I asked Erica to talk a bit about that uh, as we go through the discussion. Uh, I don't want to uh, uh, talk about it too much because I think she can talk about these issues much more. Uh, crisply, but uh, I think in general that the, the, the public statements of the Chinese leadership are that we're meeting our obligations to the UN on sanctions, that we have no obligations to any specific unilateral U.S. efforts to sanction oil. We are not fans of sanctions. We are subject to sanctions. We have been in the past. We don't believe they work. Uh, and I think overlaying all that is this trust deficit that Congressman Persiani talked about, which is very important. But I, I don't want to go too far with that. You know, the other players in this Japan and Korea, strategic allies of the U.S., very difficult for them to resist American uh, pressure to reduce their own oil purchases. But in, in the case of both, oil and energy security are existential issues. 100% import dependent oil, gas. This is a heavy lift for both the Japanese and Koreans to cut, eliminate 
uh, or should have been reduced to the rating of oil imports. They have both done so, uh, and I think that that's 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 uh, in part a reflection of their strategic partnership with the U.S. Uh, being differential to uh, China. And then India presents kind of an intermediate case, uh, Michael. If you feel like commenting as we get into that, but uh, India, somewhere in between, has deep ties in the Gulf, particularly Iran, cultural, historical, economic, and oil ties. Uh, so it's also a very difficult uh, proposition for the Indians. Uh, for a number of reasons to cut to run in oil imports. Uh, and finally, which, uh, when I asked the panel, four years down the road, Iran has nuclear weapons. Uh, would your country believe that the policy had been effective? Was it a good idea, a bad idea? How would it live with that? And what was interesting is I think each of the countries was actually much more willing to live with the notion of an Iranian nuclear power uh, than certainly the United States, which I think partly colors the, their perception, but I'm happy to, to have discussion on that. Uh, third, we looked at the Asian National Oil Companies and whether this equity impulse uh, really does serve their energy security interests. Physical control, ownership of oil, is that really something that gives you a more secure overall uh, oil supply. Uh, and on the other hand, does that somehow deny access to those oil supplies to others uh, and undermine their energy security? I think the general, Philip Andrew Speed wrote us a terrific paper. Uh, uh, he's, he's, he's superb on these kind of issues. And I think the tenor of the discussion was, answer to both of those was no and no. The physical control of some part of your oil supply Really, when you look at how much oil and gas, oil that the Asians are buying, they're simply not going to be able to control enough oil physically to really make a difference in their overall uh, need for oil. This is particularly the case of the Chinese, uh, uh, and we can we can debate that. Second, they're not taking oil off the market in the sense that some people here in Washington believe that they're denying access. The market is too big. The market is fungible. Oil prices is determined in a global balance. Uh, and so uh, the market is too big for the Asians to, to be taking oil off the market to be able to impact the price. So I think that's a fear here in Washington that's, uh, that's unfounded as well. Finally, uh, I'll, I'll shut up and turn it over to smarter people. <laughs> uh, is the issue of uh, LNG in Asia. Asia's gas use is booming, uh, and uh, if you look across the region, uh, Japan and Korea 100% dependent on imported uh, LNG. China's gas demand is booming. It's expected by the, at least the Chinese government projects that the use of gas will triple over the next decade uh, in China. These are very sizable numbers. Uh, Southeast Asia's gas use is rising dramatically, as well as, as India. So, Moving gas around Asia, really, you're talking about LNG because of the maritime distances, the tyranny of distance. Uh, you have to move it as, as LNG. And I, I would argue traditionally LNG has been a more market-driven commodity. You don't have an OPEC for gas. You don't have the geopolitics around gas and LNG that you have in the, in the oil side. Uh, it's more technical. It's more complex. These are massive projects that need giant companies to be able to put together. Uh, but I think as Asia's LNG demand accelerates, and as this Japanese demand shock has set in, which has created a sense of scarcity, fears over availability of LNG, particularly the next five years before the Australian projects and others come up, uh, that LNG is becoming a much more strategic commodity to the governments in the region. Uh, Simple example, the Japanese government pushing very hard for their big companies to go out and source LNG, generate, and buy into big LNG liquefaction projects. Lots of government support to do that, Koreans uh, as well. So I think this is becoming more politicized in a sense. I think something something to watch. And it plays into the U.S. shale debate about U.S. shale gas going into LNG exports. The Asians are... are 
are chomping at the bit to get access to U.S. LNG. Uh, it would be lower priced LNG, it would be priced against uh, uh, market driven uh, Henry Hub gas prices in the U.S., uh, which would hopefully help bring uh, slightly lower LNG prices to Asia. So uh, that's become an important issue for the region. So U.S. LNG potential is a very important topic in Tokyo, Seoul, and around the region. Much more important, I think, <laughs> often than we, have, we see it here uh, because of their concerns. So that was the range of issues we talked about. We tried to focus on some of these real nitty-gritty oil and gas uh, kinds of geopolitics. And uh, uh, I, was, I was really happy with Carlos and Pistani's. Uh, he absorbed a lot of that. That was, that was terrific uh, to hear. Now, with that long-winded introduction, uh, I think what I'll do is, is uh, first ask uh, Ed to uh, illuminate a bit about this issue of uh, as the North America becomes quasi-self-sufficient or whatever we want to call it, Ed Morse thinks we're going to become completely self-sufficient at Citibank, but uh, uh, even the DOE is talking about uh, declining port dependence. As that sets in, how do you think we're going to balance that strategic commitment to the Gulf uh, in the future, given that the Asians are the direct beneficiaries? I appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Mike. Uh, I think Mike just decided that I should go first so that I don't fall asleep in the middle of the But I really appreciate this invitation by uh, NBR. Um, it is a uh, very timely report, uh, I think, and as always, uh, very well done. Um, I will, um, Mike gave me my assignment about half an hour ago, so I, I, I would try to stick to the assignment, but I did, did read the whole report. It's a long flight from the sound of it. I took lots of notes. Yeah, but, uh, yeah I, I, and I, I will make perhaps see a, a couple of other things uh, that I took away from the report that might be um, uh, uh, fruitful for discussion uh, later. Uh, the first impression that I got after reading the report is, is um, how political uh, perception lacks reality. Uh, and and um, after all, uh, the center of gravity of the global oil market, uh, global energy market for that matter, shifted about five years ago. Uh, and uh, when non-OECD demand exceeded uh, OECD demand uh, in, in total energy, <coughs> And yet, political leaders in the West uh, continue to act as if they believe that they can continue to dominate the rules of the game when it comes to global oil and gas. Um, and is somehow offended when others with a growing stake in the game um, want to try to hand at playing the game. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. Um, really interesting that the congressman, who of course uh, comes from the district, that's very familiar with oil and gas issues, uh, talked about energy independence as a deeply flawed concept, um, which I, I guess is why politicians are talking so much about it right now, um, <laughs> including the two people at the top of the, of the uh, major party tickets. Um, first of all, the United States was never that dependent on energy imports. Uh, our, our problem was a oil import dependency. It has nothing, very little to do uh, with energy, and that all has to do with our over uh, consumption in, in transportation fuels. And unless we do something about that, uh, in spite of advances in extractive technology uh, driven by historically high oil prices, I don't think the picture is going to change very much. Um, we can talk about Western Hemisphere oil, but you know that oil doesn't belong to us. You know, Canadian oil, Brazilians, the Venezuelans may have a different view about um, uh, their oil uh, that, than we do. Uh, as Mike pointed out, we're still tied to international markets uh, and international pricing. didn't matter to the Norwegians. They are a net oil and gas exporter when Katrina and Rita happened. And global oil prices went up. They suffered along with the rest of us. Um, and will our global responsibility change very much just because we are incrementally going to be importing less oil? We never imported that much oil from the Persian Gulf to begin with, as Mike pointed out. Um, and do we want that global responsibility to change? 
I think here we are of two minds on this issue. On the one hand, we talk about you know, free riders like China uh, taking advantage of the global commons that we got. Uh, on the other hand, if they act like they might do something about this one day, like build a blue border navy, we start talking about pivoting, right? Um, I mean, do we want to share this responsibility, or do we want China to become Japan? So, hmm. you know, pay us for doing our job. Uh, don't uh, create your own capacity um, uh, for uh, uh, guarding what is vital to your own national interests. Um, and and I, I think the Iran um, sanctions issue, which Erica is, is will be addressing, um, illuminates this uh, 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 contradiction um, and, and uh, complexity very well, as did the paper uh, in the report. And it's not just China. It's India, it's Pakistan, it's Turkey, it's South Africa. Uh, I dare say even uh, the Gulf states, Korea, and Japan. Um, we know from history that oil sanctions are very, very, very difficult to enforce and are unsustainable and are unlikely to achieve the kind of policy objectives uh, that we set out to do. Uh, we found that out with apartheid South Africa. Uh, we found that out with Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Um, we may think that we have a temporary advantage on the rules of the game right now, such as banking, uh, financial transactions having to do with Iranian um, oil or shipping uh, and, and insurance and shipping. But how long is this going to last if the incremental demand is going to come from somewhere else? Are the Indians and Chinese so stupid that they can't figure out financial mechanisms of their own one day? Maybe not tomorrow, but five, ten years, fifteen years from now. Uh, do they not know how to do insurance? I mean, it's not just Lloyds that can do insurance, right? So, as we try to force our will uh, on people, uh, they may design other ways of getting around it. Uh, when I go to China, as I do regularly, the Chinese like to say, you know, I'm not trying to justify it, it's just what they say, that we don't like to obey rules that we didn't have any part in making. Um, and, and, um, and, and that's something that maybe we ought to think about. Before we apply oil sanctions uh, and consult, and, and uh, rather than consulting with London, Berlin, and Paris, uh, whose countries don't import that much Iranian oil to begin with, by the way, uh, which means that it's basically a gratuitous gesture on the part of the EU. Uh, talk about sanctions against Russia. We'll, we'll, we'll really see uh, where they stand on economic sanctions uh, having to do with oil and gas. Uh, maybe we should consult with Delhi and Beijing first before we start enacting uh, sanctions that we don't know um, uh, uh, whether it can be afford enforced or not. But our policymakers are comfortable with old habits, like going to European capitals, uh, without uh, acknowledging new realities. I hope the congressman left a few staffers behind, and I hope that Secretary Hormats would have uh, sent some staffers ahead of him uh, if, if he comes here. Um, the other issue um, that we may think about uh, regarding Chinese NOCs or NOCs from India and elsewhere um, is that um, whether they will also turn into IOCs uh, one day. Uh, I think the jury is out on that, but we tend to think that Asian IOC, NOCs will behave in a certain way, uh, and we seem to forget our own history. Now, what were BP, Total, B&I at one time? State oil companies? Um, did the U.S. not use its political influence in the Persian Gulf? Did President Roosevelt not be the king of Saudi Arabia and the Red Sea? Uh, did we not condition our support of the British effort to overthrow uh, the regime, uh, the government in, in, in Tehran on the assumption, on, on the condition that U.S. companies will break into what was previously a uh, Anglo-Persian monopoly. Uh, 
Now, using political influence to gain advantage for your companies is not something the agents invented. Um, of course, uh, uh, Chinese NOCs represents a general policy uh, where China, as the second largest economy in the world, and maybe one day the largest, who knows, uh, whether I will live to see it or not, um, but uh, would they w not want to participate fully in all the leading sectors, economic sectors of the world, uh, and oil and gas isn't uh, it, uh, that just one of them. Uh, why should they rely on Western IOCs or producing country NOCs for supply uh, without participating in the market fully themselves? After all, their companies have limited upstream um, growth uh, domestically, um, and I'm sure Erica will talk about how they have skillfully used um, this issue uh, as a political constituency uh, in Beijing to advance their goals. But at the end of the day, whether their investments are efficient or not, it's more investment. And don't we want more investment? Uh, in global or buying gas, don't we want to provide more competition? And I would, I would submit that instead of subtracting supply, they actually add supply uh, to the global market. I think what will be really worth watching in the future, and I'm sure Mike will commission a new report on this, uh, is whether um, uh, Chinese NOCs and Western IOCs will be cooperating in the future in ventures in, in third countries. Uh, as always, I believe the market will move before politicians, uh, and that together they may set future rules uh, of the game. Uh, the, the couple of points on, on um, LNG and the possibility of the United States exporting LNG um, in the near future. I, I think one of the problems of Northeast Asian LNG market is its lack of liquidity and very rigid contractual terms, uh, which doesn't provide the market mechanisms to allow you to trade freely LNG. Uh, and shale gas exports from the United States could be a game changer, along with, as Mike already referenced, uh, more LNG coming out of Australia, which is slated to become uh, the largest LNG exporter in the world, exceeding Qatar, uh, as well as these African uh, uh, gas discoveries. That uh, these are potential game changers that could lead to gas and gas competition in Northeast Asia, uh, the, the end of oil indexation in, in contracts, and pulling the three regional gas markets, that is, uh, Northwest Europe, uh, North America, and, and Northeast Asia closer together. Um, one couple of uh, <coughs> constructive criticisms of the report uh, having to do with Asian oil and gas. And this is, um, this is um, uh, because I know Mike's got other things on his mind on, on future reports. One is, uh, I think, the start, startling uh, absence of, of mention of India uh, in the report. Uh, and maybe I'm biased by having traveled in South Asia more frequently recently. When you have a country uh, that has a population the size of the United States that does not have regular access to electricity, when you could have a blackout that affects more people than the entire population of Europe. Um, as we did a few weeks ago, uh, this is a subject. Uh, if China is the story for the, this decade, India will be the story for the next decade, and it's time that we start thinking about it. Uh, the other issue that I'm sure Mike will be writing on soon uh, is uh, Asian shale gas. Um, and, and in fact, a little bit of commercial CSIS will release a report in a couple of weeks uh, on shale gas um, uh, possibilities in China and, and India as something to, to watch for in the future. Um, I probably see that my time is that up close. Yeah, no, no, thank you very much, Ed. And, and by the way, uh, you and someone there just released a, a good piece of just on Chinese shale issues. Right? It's very interesting. It was, a, it was a Russian visiting scholar who decided to uh, that 
uh, she should come to Washington to learn about China for some reason. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but we did um, issue papers on the CSIS website on, on not only Chinese shale gas, but the possibility of uh, Russian gas exports to China. Uh, because uh, that was one of the few reports I've seen was real information about the quality of the resource, the shale gas resource in China, which it turned out, at least initial drilling and other things suggest very different than U.S. shale, much less productive, for example. Uh, all shales are not the same, and so I thought it was really very useful for some real concrete data on that for something most of us have been speculating and wondering about uh, on the early uh, exploration of the Thank you. It, it, no criticism of the report allowed, though. Uh, <laughs> next time we have you. No, I think India is <laughs> not invite me again. India is like this huge, huge piece that we, we keep trying to figure out how to get our arms around uh, properly. Uh, Chandra, would you like to provide some other comments on the report your perception? Thank you, Michael, and good morning to everybody. I wish to thank NBR for this opportunity. We are very happy to participate with them and support them in their activities. Well, a lot has been covered, much of it in detail, but some significant points, which we think from an Asian perspective, which are very important on the report. Let me start off by how it ended, and that's the shale gas development in Asia. I think just as shale gas has shifted the entire demand supply perspective in North America, it has the potential to do the same in Asia as well. And exploitation of coal bed methane and shale gas has already commenced. Although the first initial results are significant, <coughs> there's no reason to believe that there will not be significant shale gas mines in Asia, especially India and China and Australia as well. So there is a possibility that this demand supply perception that is being uh, presented could change dramatically over the next few years. Now what will this lead to? First of all, it will lead to pressure on prices uh, and a reduction in Asian gas prices, a reduction in the arbitrage between the prices of gas in uh, North America and Asia, and therefore maybe a less push on imports or, or from, of uh, natural gas from North America to Asia. I would say, therefore, there is a small window of opportunity, and if North America does not enter, take advantage of the window we have into contracting for long-term sales purchase of gas to Asia, this window may shut. I am a little surprised at the discussions that have taken place in the United States whether to export or import. Coming as I do from the Asian Development Bank, normally it's the smaller countries like Bangladesh who have this reporting debate. I, it's very surprising to see a country like America, which is a, we all think as a sort of a bastion for market forces to operate, to have this debate for so long. Anyway, that's my take. The second problem that such shale gas production in China or India would have is to lead to issues of what to do with the fixed price contracts that have been entered into the, in the past between the leading producers in Middle East and Central Asia with East Asian consumers. These have been entered into over the long term. They are essentially fixed, although there are some swing uh, contracts in them. And how we negotiate out of or find a resolution to some of these uh, projects or contracts will be a, a, a major factor in how the use of gas plays out. LNG shipping is now very common. It used to be a fixed place-to-place -place type arrangement 10 years ago. As the report points out, it's become more spot. It's more like oil now than it natural gas was. And therefore, that gives a little more freedom to both producers and consumers to negotiate their way, way out of certain uh, historical situations. And that's a good flexibility that we have. Uh, the second major issue or point that I don't find reflected in the report, and which, which could have a bearing, is this whole issue of climate discussions. I'm very grateful to the lady. She seems to be the only one that has uh, sort of mentioned that aspect. 
Another major change in the attitude of North America versus Asia is the attitude here is you find and you burn. In Asia, even if you find, you don't burn. So you will find that many major oil and gas producing major nations like Qatar, Abu Dhabi, etc., they are also the biggest investors in nuclear power and renewable energy like solar and so on. The reason is everybody is preparing for a shift. Should the shift occur, they want to be sure that their bets are not all on one commodity or one type of business. And that's the reason. So if you look at the investments that Asia has made over the last few years on, for example, nuclear, uh, almost the entire global growth in, nuclear, in the nuclear industry is exclusively comes from Asia. And there is no, we have not seen a stalling of this. It's still continuing despite the problems that Japan is having or Germany's policy of going non-nuclear. Renewables last year, more than 50% of the renewable investment globally were, were in Asia. And Asia has far overtaken Europe and North America in this. Almost 30 gigawatts of generation capacity came from renewables in Asia alone last year. And energy conservation. You will see voluntary cuts of energy intensity of between 10 to 20 percent in the national plans of most large Asian economies. That includes India, China, Indonesia, Thailand, what have you. The reason is it's not only production or increase in production and consumption that's to form a basis for energy independence. It's also decrease in consumption. So they are focusing more on the consumption angle. And this could change the way demand grows in Asia. Uh, the second aspect I would like to point out about this investment in long term uh, investment in renewable energy and conservation is that it has a long tail. Once you start developing these industries or you put up these facilities, they last for 25 years. So there is a long tail to this, these investments. Second, they serve as a, a vehicle for bringing down prices of alternate or supplemental energy resources. Three years ago, the price for solar, for example, was 35 US cents per kilowatt hour in Asia. Uh, last year, the lowest bids in China came out at 12 cents, India at 16 cents. And these are stable because we are seeing many companies bid close to these prices. So it's not, it's not a, let's say, a lo losing price or a closing down shop price or something like that as people fear. This is a now a, a viable price. 16 US cents per kilowatt hour is today a viable globally big price. Uh, which means that if the prices come down to this level, they will be reverse app applied in places today where there is a higher risk in applying this, these sources of energy. For example, Spain or your southern Europe, southern US could start back if the prices go low enough. Uh, the third point which I would like to have a broad wish to bring out was the risks. Why are Asian nations spreading their investments into various types of generation activities like nuclear renewables and LNG terminals? Basically, it's the risk of stoppage of fracking due to some environment issues. It's still a recent phenomenon. You have a four-year track record only. And should something happen, you know, with where environmentally there is even a stoppage of fracking, the change could be very dramatic. The shock could be very high, and therefore there was a, there is a need to guard against this. Uh, and that's one of the things that are uppermost in their mind. The second is another nuclear accident in large countries like China or India, like Fukushima, who again completely change or alter the strategy that large Asian nations are putting together today. Uh, finally, one other risk they see is complete breakdown in climate change discussions. Despite the posturing and the general, let's say, dysfunctionality of the inter-country negotiations in the climate change area, there is some positivity in the sense that individual countries are voluntarily going ahead to do certain things. And this is what is keeping the industry alive. But should there be a dramatic reversal and everybody says, I don't care what happens to the other guy, let them all go to hell. I have my resources. I'm going to continue the way I am to burn and, 
produce hydrocarbons, well, the whole paradigm shifts. And that's something we are keeping our fingers crossed should not happen. An issue that arose in the report and was mentioned by Ed is the, the sort of uh, the issue of national oil companies versus international oil companies. Again, the Asian perspective is something different, something that Ed has already mentioned. They see the necessity for national oil companies not so much as buying up resources as being a fair player in the market. After all, when you talk about international oil companies having raised their capital in the United States or UK or elsewhere in Europe, they are more susceptible to political pressure from those countries. Therefore, large Asian nations like India, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, they see them as not being truly international oil companies. Therefore, the need to set up parallel or competitive oil companies that can play by their fair rules, if I may use that term. And that's the reason. Now, over time, that's going to mutate. And of course, shares are being offered in the international oil markets of these national oil companies as well to make them international in the long term. So I won't be afraid of them buying up assets or cornering assets. It's just that they are more companies or more international companies in the making for developing oil and natural gas uh, resources. And this is probably going to continue with shipping companies or the entire value chain of uh, oil and natural gas. Uh, Ed gave some pretty old examples of 50 years ago on the behavior of oil, international oil companies. Even very recent, I don't know how many of you know that despite all the sanctions that were placed in, on Myanmar a few years ago, the biggest investors in Myanmar oil and natural gas were Total of France and Unocal of USA. And while maybe 10 or $20 million in aid budget was being cut as a symbol, $600 million plus was being invested in the oil fields in this country. And I don't know whether you know that 34% of the Thai gas import comes from Myanmar has always come from Myanmar. So I think that goes to show that the Asian perception of some of these ground rules of international oil companies are, and therefore the necessity to, quote unquote, take corrective actions by having national oil companies. So I'll end there. I think uh, these are some Asian perspectives. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And again, my apologies for putting you at the World Bank. Kind of that means I know that's inexcusable. <laughs> Thank you. Please, don't hold it against Meredith. There have been so many meetings this week, I can't remember my name. So. Yeah. Thank you. Erica, would you like to talk a little about starting the uh, other and other whatever aspects? Sure. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. As Mike mentioned, I'm going to talk about China and Iran sanctions, especially U.S. unilateral sanctions on Iran. Uh, and in my remarks, I'd like to address three questions. Uh, the first one is, what are some of the factors uh, influencing uh, China's response to sanctions, um, especially U.S. unilateral sanctions? Uh, second question I'd like to address is, how has China... Uh, both the government level and the corporate level, uh, responded to the sanctions on the Central Bank of Iran that President Obama signed into law on December 31st. Um, and then the third and final question I'll address is the $64,000 one that Mike had mentioned earlier, which is what can the United States do to elicit more cooperation from China on Iran? Uh, so to begin, what are some of the factors that um, are shaping China's response to U.S. sanctions on Iran? Uh, there are five I'd like to run through in no particular order. Uh, the first one is one that Mike already mentioned in his remarks, uh, which are the Chinese government views of sanctions. Um, in general, uh, Beijing views sanctions as an ineffective tool uh, of statecraft, and certainly as we heard from Ed, there's certainly a historical record uh, to back up that view. And when it comes to um, um, to different types of sanctions, uh, the Chinese government finds robust unilateral you know, sanctions to be much more distasteful than limited multilateral ones. Uh, there is a view in China, which has been stated by the country's ambassador to the United Nations, that limited multilateral sanctions sometimes uh, can
can be effective in getting the target back to the negotiating table, uh, but when it comes to sort of changing behaviors, uh, robust sanctions um, are counterproductive because they often serve simply to further radicalize the target. Um, another factor uh, shaping China's uh, views on Iran's sanctions is energy. Uh, Iran was China's third largest supplier of crude oil last year behind Saudi Arabia and Angola, providing north of 550,000 barrels per day. Um, a third factor is concerns about nuclear proliferation. China, like the United States, has no interest in seeing Iran acquire nuclear weapons capability. Uh, however, that being said, my sense is that uh, Beijing probably regards a nuclear-armed Iran as a less acute threat to national security than the United States does. Um, a fourth factor is China's relationship with the United States. Uh, the relationship with the United States is China's most important bilateral relationship. Uh, so since there is a desire to avoid having Iran um, become a major source of tension between the two countries, you know, on the other hand, I suspect that uh, the government is probably a bit tired of repeatedly being asked to comply uh, with new U.S. unilateral sanctions on Iran. Uh, and the fifth factor I'd like to mention, which I'm going to return to at the end of my remarks, are the corporate interests of a Chinese oil company called Sinopec. Uh, on the one hand, all of the oil that China imports from Iran ends up in Sinopec refineries. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Sinopec has ambitious plans to expand its presence here in the United States. Uh, so the second question I wanted to uh, address today is how uh, has China responded to the new sanctions uh, on Iran that were signed into law on December 31st? Uh, these are sanctions that were contained in the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012, and they prescribe penalties uh, for uh, financial institutions that do business with the Central Bank of Iran, which is the clearinghouse for all oil payments. Uh, and these sanctions um, posed a much greater challenge um, for uh, Asian buyers of, of oil than they did uh, certainly for buyers in other parts of the world. Um, you know, some of the biggest buyers of uh, Iranian crude are China, India, Japan, and South Korea. Um, and the government's response is one that Mike had already mentioned in his remarks, which was that uh, we comply with multilateral sanctions. Um, our energy trade uh, and uh, investment ties with Iran comply with UN sanctions on Iran, and those are the sanctions we're going to follow. Uh, therefore, these new U.S. sanctions on the Central Bank of Iran are not going to have any impact on China's energy relationship with Iran. That was the government's statement, and it's been repeated multiple times since December 31st, 2011. Uh, however, the Chinese oil companies uh, had a different response. And even though the government said these sanctions aren't going to impact our energy ties with Iran, they did. And that's because both uh, Chinese and Iranian oil traders uh, responded to the sanctions by getting involved uh, in a contract dispute. Uh, every year, the Chinese and the Iranians sit down in November or December to negotiate uh, their supply contracts for the following year. And so in November or December 2011, when they started their negotiations, uh, the new sanctions on the Central Bank of Iran were basically a done deal. Both sides knew that. And so they responded to that by pushing for different contract terms. Uh, the Chinese wanted lower prices and a longer credit period. Uh, whereas the Iranians wanted the Chinese to pay higher prices and a shorter credit period. And this dispute lasted for about four months. Um, it didn't end until late March 2012. And a result of that, there was a big drop in Chinese purchases of crude oil from Iran. Uh, in, in the first five months of this year, uh, Chinese oil imports from Iran were down 25%. Um, and it's on the basis of that reduction that China was granted a 180-day uh, exemption from these sanctions on June 28th, on the last day um, that President Obama had a chance to do so. Uh, and I think that exemption was warranted based strictly on the numbers. If you look at China's year-on-year -year percentage reduction, and if you look at their volume reduction, and you compare those to the percentage and volume reductions um, of other major Asian buyers, Japan, Korea, um, India, uh, it certainly uh, was warranted. Um, and this brings me to like, the last issue that I wanted to touch on, which is the question of what can the United States do to elicit uh, more cooperation from China on the Iranian nuclear issue. And this has become an increasingly sort of important issue as China basically has emerged as the linchpin um, of the U.S.-led international sanctions against Iran because Chinese oil companies are among the only major players 
left in the Iranian upstream. Uh, China is a major buyer of Iranian crude, uh, currently the largest buyer, buying about half the crude oil that Iran exports. Um, and Chinese companies are also occasional sellers of gasoline to Iran. Uh, so what can the United States do um, to get more cooperation from China? Uh, and the one answer that I'd like to propose today is that the United States can continue to welcome Chinese national oil companies to invest in the North American upstream. Um, over the past few years, uh, North America has emerged as the preferred destination for Chinese oil companies. Uh, so far in 2012 alone, 95 percent of Chinese upstream M&A uh, including CNUC's uh, proposed acquisition of Nexen, um, is here in North America. Um, and at the same time that Chinese investments in North America have been increasing, they've really been slowing down their activities in the Iranian upstream. Uh, and I think one way to sort of get this trend to continue um, is to uh, welcome Chinese oil companies to continue to invest here because that forces them to make a choice between the American market and the Iranian market. Uh, for example, um, as many of you know, earlier this summer, uh, the Chinese oil company Sinook announced that it was going to buy Canadian headquartered company Nexen. That company has assets here in the United States as a result of that. Uh, and if this deal goes through, Sinook will be uh, an operator. They'll be the first Chinese oil company to have an operating role in the United States. Uh, and because of that, that deal is currently being reviewed by the Committee on Foreign Investment uh, in the United States. Uh, and I'm certain that one of the questions at the top of uh, Sophia's list for CMUC is what are you doing in Iran? And so I think one way to uh, get Chinese oil companies to slow down in Iran is to have them come here um, not only as passive investors but also as operators because that will force them to make that choice. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. That's wonderful. Uh, I think that last point is critical. It's really important. Yeah. I said that to the uh, U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission in January when I testified, and that did a good response. Uh, <laughs> Shocking. Yeah. Um, but I, I think you're absolutely right. And the question is, how do we you know, try to find a way to, to, to improve the comfort level of our country? Identify yourself uh, and try to wait for the. Uh, if you have a big booming voice, you don't have to wait for the, uh, the mic, but if you don't, please wait for the mic. But let's call from uh, National Pension University. Right. Uh, thank you. A terrific presentation. Mike, a couple years ago, you and I had a conversation about uh, Japanese infrastructure problems relative to taking full advantage of the, uh, the gas fields around Sakhalin. I wonder if you could provide some update on that. And, and Erica, uh, I'm fond of saying that, that China gets about 70% of its daily energy requirements writ large from indigenous coal, which I understand is still a pretty <coughs> inefficient industry there. I wonder if there's flexibility or room for improvement in China's indigenous coal industry that will somehow reduce the reliance on imported oil and gas. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, are you thinking about the pipeline system and the ability to how they can bring the gas in the limitation? Yeah. Exxon is a partner, a major sponsor of, uh, of uh, Sakhalin 1 project, which is mainly oil, but also has a great deal of gas. Sakhalin 2 is the shell project, which is LNG liquefied natural gas. Uh, and originally, Exxon wanted to build a uh, under, undersea pipeline from Sakhalin 1 to Japan to move that gas. That was a more economical project than building a giant expensive liquefaction plant. Uh, but the difficulty there is that Japan does not have a national grid. It doesn't have a big trunk line pipeline system. Uh, you know, the U.S. We're, we're blessed with this development of this intricate, huge continental uh, pipeline system that you can put gas in Brownsville, Texas, and it goes all the way to Ottawa if you need it to. And so Japan has a, what Japan has is a series of uh, local coastal uh, gas markets 
that have been fed by LNG, who Japan essentially invented the LNG business along with Algeria back in the you know, late 60s and early 70s in order to, for Japan to be able to access natural gas the only way, Indonesia and other places. So the shape of the Japanese geography pipeline system in these local uh, markets that are now fed by LNG and the cost of land, the lack of availability of land to actually begin to build the truck system means that L LNG is, is going to be the game pretty much for the future. I don't, I don't think anything's changed in that. Anything made to do more than that. Uh, uh, the Russians are not talking about an LNG project to Vladivostok, which right. only the Russians could dream up. Um, it's the most economically nonsensical project you can think of, uh, but the, the companies would prefer to have a third train uh, for Sakhalin LNG, which is more, more likely to go forward uh, than the... Uh, the Vladivostok LNG pro uh, project that Putin once again announced at a at the impact of uh, the release of yeah, I mean, if, if you put a third train in Sakhalin, the gas would be half the cost of building the Vladivostok LNG plant. But that's not the issue for Putin. Erica, do you want to talk about the coal? Um, sure. I mean, there are, there have been reforms underway in China in recent years aimed at consolidating um, the coal industry, I think mean, partly. Um, due to desire to increase efficiency. Um, but I think if you look at oil and natural gas and what um, experts inside and outside of China are saying about where demand and imports are going to go, I think there is a consensus that they're going to go up um, when it comes to, to natural gas. So the government does have ambitious plans to uh, double the role of natural gas in the energy mix from 3.9% in 2010 to 8% um, in 2015. And there is a recognition that in order to achieve that goal, um, there are going to have to be uh, increasing volumes of imported gas coming into China. Um, and I think the goal sort of reflects the fact that there's a recognition that natural gas is a great transition fuel to a lower carbon future. On the coal side, the Chinese are putting in a lot of effort on the consumption. So if you look at the power plants that have been added in China over the last few years, they've all been very high efficiency supercritical plants, 41 plus percent efficiency. And that's allowed them to take offline the old 32 percent to 34 percent efficient plants. So in a sense, they improved their coal consumption efficiency as well over the last few years. And just to emphasize how important this is, China's coal consumption is half the global consumption on a daily basis. They've been building 80 gigawatts a year on average uh, of coal-fired power. Uh, that, that's a big plant, 250 megawatt plant, six days a week equivalent. I mean, it's just a staggering number. So shifting from 32% to 42% efficiency is a huge, huge important. Yes, sir? Uh, I ran the uh, private power program in the World Bank for Pakistan, Bangladesh. And I don't think you guys cover the policy issues of government on energy. And these are absolutely self defeating. Uh, first of all, there is the pricing of electricity in India. There's also the pricing of natural resources. Uh, in I bet that by 1998, uh, Fisher Force of Pakistan was 30 trillion cubic feet of gas. That was on their own records. They have drilled four wells in 98. And then they come to the World Bank saying, give us money in order to drill four more. And why should I bring up? <laughs> you know? Same thing in Bangladesh. And of course, once they found the gas, Chevron, sorry, you didn't uh, tell they, they refused to uh, export it across the border to Calcutta, which is the oldest private company in India. And I think this, I think that India's uh, changed its uh, policy in that respect, but I think it's very important that uh, we look at policies and uh, try and eliminate this historic that goes on, because they're so self defeating In my case, the private power people were 5,000 megawatts to put up for six years. And uh, this is all in the northern Punjab area. And they were saying, why don't we do a pipeline from uh, uh, Uzbekistan through Kabul into the hall? And we looked at that. You know, the only thing that's stable will do it. 
And then along comes <coughs> certain government officials, and we look up and say, we want to build this tiny line, which we rejected. Thank you. Thank you. These, this is what Chandra's comment about kind of this research nationalism, uh, and it's deeply ironic to hear the U.S., which has been preaching for as long as anyone else can remember, open markets, open access to resources, free markets, allow the investment to flow. That's been probably the number one principle of our energy security strategy globally to turn around and begin to have this debate about. That's hoarding. This is a hoarding response. It is deeply cynical from the perspective of yeah, but, when but Mike, see Mike you, you and I are old enough to remember when we restricted the export of Alaska crude oil uh, to Japan. So this is not the first. Yeah. Um, how well does that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it's it's um, policy and politics, uh, which also apply. And I'm convinced that Mike will be doing a report on South Asia next time, so we'll correct that. Uh, on the parts that, 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 that are missing. But, but, but the policy framework uh, applies to China as well. Uh, I mean, Chinese are experimenting, we announced at the end of last year, experimenting, experimenting with natural gas pricing reform in two provinces, Guangdong and Guangxi, uh, that may or may not drive future pricing reform. And in order to either develop shale gas, develop more tight gas, conventional gas, and, uh, in China, as well as to uh, uh, um, allow uh, more imports to come in. Pricing reform is also necessary in, in China. So these very high consumption targets uh, presupposes some policy reform on, on the part of China. One good thing about the Chinese is that they're very good at experimenting and adapting from lessons learned from uh, experimenting in, in a few places and trying to extend it universally. Um, and, and maybe there's some lessons to be learned in the future for South Asia as well. So I, I just came back from this long apart, so I, I'm well aware of the, some of the policy barriers that, that you mentioned and met with a number of the companies to, that would like to invest more in natural gas production uh, in, in Pakistan, but, but are currently not able to. But there are also signs of, of, of reform there. So, finally. Yeah, finally. For incremental production. Yeah, I mean, energy pricing across developing Asia is an enormous problem. You underprice electricity, and then you try to, try to generate the resources to generate electricity. The electricity price is so low that you lose money on every kilowatt you produce. Uh, you get low electricity prices, then you have to impose low natural gas prices at the wellhead and low coal prices uh, in the face of rising costs. It simply doesn't work. What you end up with is chronic energy shortages, massive on scale, and that's exactly what, is, what you see across the region. That's my, when I teach my class, that's what I spend most of my time talking about, not this other stuff about energy security. It's the internal pathologies. Yes, sir. Robert Red, international investor. I wonder if any of you can reflect on uh, another infrastructure question, and that is uh, refinery capacity. We know all these nations, India, China especially, is going to need a very uh, refined fuel mix for all sorts of transportation, aviation, etc. Are we seeing much being uh, built in the way of refinery and storage capacity? You know, China's building uh, something close to a million barrels a day of refining capacity over the last several years uh, and upgrading the refining system that they have so that they can take the heavier crews that they're, they're going to need from the Middle East in the future. Uh, sign up packets, massive investments in, in uh, both new grassroots refineries, but expanding and upgrading the capacity of existing refiners to take the heavier. Uh, a nastier crude mix that they're going to have to rely on. Uh, India, again, has built huge refining capacity over the last five to seven years. In fact, the, the irony is, is that high oil prices, this massive boom in demand for oil in Asia, but the refining margins are just dog they're terrible. <laughs> and and uh, you can't make money in refining here. It's very difficult. The Singapore Refining Center in, in Asia chronically losing money or barely making money compared to, you know, what, what often are very good margins in, 
in North America uh, and even Europe. So you have the irony of huge boom in demand, but lousy refining economics. A, a lot of that because you had massive building in China, massive building in India, and that's built upon the top of big refining capacity in Korea uh, and lots of excess refining capacity in Japan with the declining uh, oil demand. So, uh, yes, tons of it. from the Carnegie Endowment. Um, given the uh, China's current, like, recent discovery and uh, drilling of uh, new energy sources as, uh, such as shale gas or um, LNG, uh, do you think that it will have an implication on China's um, role in the, is the abroad dispute in terms of like South China Sea or East China Sea or even like reduce its role in, um, in um, uh, Middle East? Thank you. Uh, I happen to think that, and I'm maybe in the minority here. Uh, it, 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 it's sometimes wrong, but you never in doubt. Right. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm convinced uh, that neither the South China Sea or East China Sea disputes have anything to do with oil and gas, or very little to do with oil and gas. And I disagree with the congressman uh, on that. It has lots to do with sovereignty. It has lots to do with control, it has lots to do with shipping, it has more to do with fishery than it does with, 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 with oil and gas. Uh, China imports 5 million barrels per day, today. No geologists think that we're going to find 5 million barrels per day of production in the South China Sea or the East China Sea. Uh, there is just no replacement for secure sea lanes, the import of, of incremental oil and gas supplies, mainly from the Persian Gulf. Uh, so, you know, I, I just think that this, this is a sexy issue that, that the media and politicians like to talk about. It reminds me of all the oil and gas we're supposed to discover very soon in the Falklands uh, <laughs> as soon as the war is over. Uh, and we never found any, you know, at least not enough to write home about. Uh, so, um, no, I don't think that uh, the, um, the uh, either shale gas, LNG, uh, will change the East China Sea, uh, South China Sea equation very much. And let's not forget, it's not just China. It's Vietnam disputing with the Philippines, it's Korea disputes with Japan. Uh, this is a much more multifaceted game uh, than just a, a Chinese one. I, I'm a little bit concerned about American policymakers putting the heat on the issue. Um, you know, uh, Se Secretary Clinton's comments in the ASEAN uh, meeting a couple years ago, uh, and then, um, kind of ironically, um, uh, her and, and uh, Mr. Panetta telling the, the Asians to chill. Uh, recently, on an issue that they helped um, sort of uh, heat up, um, but uh, the, no, the, oil, the fact of the matter is oil and gas won't be developed fully, assuming it exists, until there's a multilateral agreement that would secure uh, companies' abilities to operate. They, they can do seismic surveys. They can even do exploratory drilling. But you cannot operate in a disputed area. Think of the insurance premiums. Uh, you're going to really put a billion dollar platform uh, uh, in an area where, uh, where gunboats can harass you, uh, where you can't do crew change, you can't supply, you can't even bring food uh, to your work, hundreds of workers. Uh, it's just not on. And unless we see the, a North Sea kind of you know, collective agreement on demarcation, uh, there's not going to be uh, much uh, oil and gas development uh, in the disputed part of the South China Sea, I don't think. Now, for rebuttal, um, Mike. <laughs> no, I, I, I couldn't agree. Well, I, I've said in the past, I think it has a multiplier effect. I think it raises the stakes a bit. But fundamentally, it's, a, it, it's about sovereignty. The only other thing I'd add, I think, is the, I think the risk for the oil sector is that the energy is that the governments use staking out oil blocks and their oil company activities as stalking horses, markers for their territorial claims. And you saw this with Sinook 
uh, recently, uh, setting out for bid a string of blocks right offshore of Vietnam, which traces the Chinese claim line well within what the Vietnamese see as their territory waters. And, and this is a very, very explicit use of this, of the industry, uh, uh, you know, bidding to try to mark out strategic territory. And I think that's that's very dangerous. The Filipinos have started doing those kinds of things. Uh, so I, that's a risk that that oil blocks and oil offers will begin to be used as stocking horses for state interest. And unfortunately for CNO, the, the head of CNO, when they recently launched their first deep water drilling rig uh, out of Shanghai, and in the launching ceremonies, the head of CNO said, this is Chinese strategic territory that we can move to put uh, where, where we have sovereign control. That's an unfortunate uh, thing to have said because they've spent all of their time saying we, we are not instruments of the state, we are an oil company, we need to be viewed as an oil company when they invest here, for example. So I think there's there's that risk. You think it might be come up in the CFIUS discussion? I have a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that um, the, CNOC, the, the chairman of CNOC as well as the executives at Netson probably wish that uh, Wang Yi had not made that remark. Um, actually, two two things to add to what um, Ed and Mike said. One, um, nobody knows for sure how much oil and gas is in the South China Sea or the East China Sea just because it hasn't been fully explored. And so, uh, while different companies and countries might think there's there's potential, uh, nobody knows. So it's not something that's um, you know that's, that's bankable. Um, and then I guess going back to uh, you know to CNOC, I, I would agree with with Mike's analysis that there really were sort of two sort of things that CNOC did this spring um, that suggests that it was sort of under pressure from you know sort of from the government to sort of help advance um, and China's interest in the South China Sea. You know, one of course were the remarks by Chairman Wang Yilin, and the other were the auctioning of these blocks that were in disputed areas. You know, my sense is that Sina probably felt that for both of these, I think Sina was in part playing to a domestic political audience that, you know, you have to remember for a lot of people that had these companies, you know, this isn't the pinnacle of their career. Um, you know, that a lot of them do have ambitions to hold higher positions in the Chinese party state. And certainly Wang Yilin is, 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 is of an age where he, he could be promoted in the future. And so I think part of this, um, is about showing how corporate interests are, are serving national ones. But I think it is unfortunate because obviously people pick up on these things, we pick up on them, um, and it can, you know, sort of potentially raise complications for other issues, you know, especially in the case of CNIP, I think there probably has been some reputational damage where, you know, a lot of effort has been spent um, talking about how it's, you know, and I think it is a, a, a relatively autonomous company, but then, you know, it's harder for, for to make that argument when, could, could I add something, Mike, uh, having to do with the question I raised of, of whether Chinese NOCs in time will uh, become much more like IOCs and behave in, uh, in the IOC-like manner. Uh, I, I think one counter to that is that as long as the CEO of the state oil company is selected by the personnel department of the Chinese Communist Party, that's kind of a tough pitch uh, 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 to, to make, uh, as well as the fact that the state retains majority ownership uh, on, on all three major Chinese NOCs. Uh, the, the, the process of reform of the Chinese oil sector, which started in the mid-90s, Erica, is that right? Uh, it seemed to have stalled. Um, there was talk at one time, particularly after the Unical debacle, uh, about whether Chinese oil companies should really be majority owned by the state or should more shares be floated uh, uh, in the exchange so that the state could retain a golden share or a minority share but not have majority control. Uh, you saw the beginnings of real independent outside directors on the CNO board, which ironically had something to do with why they were so slow off the mark under the cap. Um, but, but that has stalled, and, and I, I think this is one of the things that the Chinese government will have to decide in terms of future policy, whether it wants these companies to evolve into internationally competitive oil companies that would be welcomed in, in all countries or not, 
and what policies they need to pursue in order to allow that eventuality, if it's desirable, uh, to, to happen. Uh, you know, look at the World Bank uh, re uh, study recently on, on state enterprises, uh, focused on state enterprise reform uh, in China. Uh, there are a lot of necessary conditions yet uh, that, that is not currently present that would allow uh, Chinese oil companies or ONGC or Gale or anyone else to become much more like uh, IOCs. Uh, and this is something to watch in terms of future Asian consuming country NOCs as opposed to uh, producing country NOCs. Uh, Yes. Uh, my name is Xi Jinping from JBLC. Um, but I guess my question may be uh, to Mr. Chandra about the role of coal in the Asian region. So you mentioned uh, about, you briefly mentioned about the situation in, in India, but um, and also contemplating not only CCS, uh, and I'm also contemplating about uh, uh, high efficiency burning technology, like you mentioned, and taking those uh, technology and uh, into account, and also uh, also taking into account the existence of Australia as a uh, exporting industry, a country of relatively uh, high efficiency coal. So. Can you share with uh, me about your uh, thought about the long term, uh, a little bit longer term picture about the role of the coal in Asian uh, energy sector, and also uh, your view about the possible uh, impact on our discussion in the Asian region about oil and gas demand and the energy portfolio as a whole. Uh, our view is that in the medium term, coal demand will increase, both in India and at least will remain flat, but mom, there will be a minor increase in China as well. The reason is both countries perceive coal as being an exploitable domestic reserve that they have, and uh, their industries, their backstream industries are geared towards producing equipment that exploit both production and consumption of coal. <coughs> that said, there has been shortages in coal, and the coal in India especially has been of a very inferior quality, and therefore increasing amounts of coal from Indonesia and uh, Australia imports have taken place over the last few years. I think a lot is to do with the pricing of natural gas and oil in the uh, international markets. If the price of gas moderates in Asia, I think we will see a reduction in the amount of coal being used domestically. I think they will still encourage international coal imports because that helps them improve the efficiencies of the boilers and going for higher, uh, more efficient consum uh, consumption. Both India and China have promised to reduce their energy intensity in the economy, not energy use. And I think we need to be very clear on that. Their overall energy use is going to increase. What they have promised is their energy intensity or efficiency of energy use will be sharply up over the last few years, or next few years. That's the same of Indonesia as well. They will also be increasing their consumption of coal, but they will be increasing their energy efficiency of the use. Yes, sir. Could you uh, identify? Yes, uh, Henry Sikalski with uh, the Non-Proliferation Policy Education Center. I'm curious to get any impressions from any of the panelists on this question. What are the, maybe just the top three uh, obstacles uh, or challenges for increasing uh, the importation of natural gas from Russia, I guess Alaska, because it it's a slightly different place than the U.S., Canada, it is, yes, the U.S., 
to Japan and Korea on the one hand and China. What does it look like? Is it a mad race or is it going to be very, very difficult for them to increase their exports? And if so, what are the three things in each case? Uh, by, by the way, there's a new book that just came out from the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies by my old friend Kim Peck, Dr. Peck, on Russian uh, China energy relations. It's got encyclopedic detail on both oil and gas and the problems and things. So that piece of uh, I also just came back from Moscow. On the way to Pakistan. Um, and and, and the, the barrier is primarily economics. I mean, the, the economic hurdle is extremely hard to overcome. There are no pipelines uh, talking now from, Russia. From, from Russia. Well, for, for that matter, no, no pipelines in Alaska to take no slow gas to the coast and then liquefy it. Uh, no pipeline from Alberta to, to British Columbia and lots of routing problems uh, uh, along the way. So even though, in theory, you have stranded assets in the case of uh, Alaskan gas or East Siberian gas, uh, like Kavitka, uh, or, or uh, Canadian gas that, that uh, don't have as big a market in the US um, as um, um, uh, it was thought because of US shale gas revolution, uh, the economic uh, obstacles are, are extremely difficult. And someone has to take the financial risk. And, and the question is, who's going to do that? And so if you look at the Russian-Chinese argument, which has been going on actually the, in the current version the last six years, uh, but really has been going on for 30 years, uh, much like you know, the, the Russians say, how long have you been talking about importing or, or, or moving Alaskan gas to the lower 30, uh, 48? And I say as long as you guys have been talking about it, it, it could to the China pipeline. Um, 30 some years, uh, it is just very, very hard. Um, and someone has to make a pricing concession uh, because it's very hard in the case of Russia uh, to beat the European market when you have existing infrastructure versus building tens of billions of dollars in new infrastructure in order to move gas to a remote market uh, like China. Uh, but that doesn't mean it won't happen. It's just that you know it, it's going to take a long time uh, for the, the conditions to be right. Uh, you know, I commend this article that my Russian uh, visiting scholar uh, uh, wrote and was just uh, released about a week or so ago. It's available on the CSIS website. Um, as to some of the real uh, uh, problems of, of moving gas in, in, into China. The Koreans, interestingly, are talking about um, moving gas through North Korea to, to South Korea, which is, you know, strikes me as, as the, the ultimate political project. <laughs> um, and, 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 um, but um, uh, no, the, um, the possibilities are there, but you have to overdoing, you know, over come to economics, and someone has to be willing to take the price risk. I, I, I would just add, you have to have the Chinese market as the base load market for Russian gas, because Korea by itself isn't a big enough incremental market. Japan, remember, Japan has this pipeline grid issue, and you just, you can't pipe it very effectively, there because it just stops at one place in the coast. Uh, I, I would argue that on a big scale, the Kovicta gas, for example, Kovicta, which is the big field in Irkutsk, the big gas field, which was originally targeted to move uh, to Asia, would be reasonably economic on a large scale if it were done on a commercial proposition and not by gas product, which, you know, but, but that's, a, that's whole, a different set of problems. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that introduces all these other problems. So I think the commerciality, if you had a big commitment from the Chinese market, Korean market, those two would be enough to commercially proposition, move convict the gas to uh, to China and Korea. The problem is, is the political gas from Russia. And then the Chinese have 
have, have been unwilling to earlier to pay the kind of prices of gas problem or the European equivalent prices at the border for the gas. And instead, the Chinese went to Turkmenistan, Myanmar, LNG, and all these other sources. So the Russians have missed the window for the next decade. The Chinese feel very comfortable with the supply picture on gas from all these other supply sources. So the Russians are pushing on string now, at least until post-2020. It's very complicated. But, and I think Alaska, it's just the cost structure there. It's, and it's, you can move it south to the coast. Pipeline costs, the perfection costs. That, that might be a dicey proposition, and you've got to come overcome all the pipeline permitting and all the kind of politics. There. And it's on the subject of uh, North American LNG in Asia, and specifically into China. I mean, I think in theory there's an interest there. I think the Chinese oil companies would love exposure to North American gas prices, um, and it certainly looks like um, exports from either U.S. Gulf Coast or British Columbia um, would be cheaper than, you know, some of the oil index contracts that Chinese oil companies have signed um, to buy LNG from, you know, places like Australia um, and Qatar, you know, but there are a number of obstacles. That's why I said in theory, I mean, there's the whole issue we talked about earlier about, you know, we here in the United States, how do we feel about being, you know, a, a, a gas exporter? Is this something uh, that we want to do or not? Plus there's the issue that, you know, even, um, uh, of um, the fact that right now, if you want to um, buy LNG from the United States, you have to have a free trade agreement with the United States, uh, which which China does. And I mean, I think that's something that you know can. And, uh, yeah, I, th I think that that is an obstacle um, to gas exports it may change down the road. Um, you know, but, but there's that issue there. And in Canada, there's the issue of sort of building uh, the infrastructure to the West Coast. Uh, Chinese. Uh, national oil companies have taken positions in some natural gas plays and some LNG projects in Canada. So I think that indicates, um, you know, that there's interest there. But then there's the whole issue, I think, for the uh, companies involved in these projects is sort of looking into the future, looking at when they'd be brought online, and sort of what does the gas supply demand balance look at look for look like in China at that point? How much LNG do they already have contracted from other buyers? What does demand look like the wild part of shale? Uh, and so on and so forth. So again, I think there's, there's an interest, but there are a lot of obstacles that have to be overcome. Uh, I, we were running down a time, uh, you in the back, and then we we'll have to last. Hi, my name is Brenda Schaefer. I'm from the University of Haifa, and I work on Caspian Energy and Eastern Mediterranean gas. We're sitting here 10 years from now, and you have to say, you're talking about demand rising in Asia for gas. Where will be the new sources of gas coming from? If you had to guess, is it Eastern Mediterranean? Is it Mozambique? Is it new production in Qatar and Australia? Is it domestic production? Where, where is the gas going to come from? Your, I'd like to hear all the panelists guess the most likely. All the above. I, guess. <laughs> I think the, the demand is potentially so large uh, that, I don't know, Eastern Mediterranean, I'm not convinced about that one myself. I uh, have some friends look at those fields. But, uh, East Africa offshore, absolutely, uh, will be moving that direction. Qatar will be, because Qatar has to worry about losing our share to the Australians who are just going, uh, you know, eventually all these things will come online. And, uh, and other Asian projects, so they're, they're thinking about how they maintain their market share. So Qatar, uh, where, where else across Asia, they're hoping for U.S. LNG, uh, Canadian LNG, uh, what other... Uh, I think what, what may be more important is whether the LNG market with multiple, many more suppliers and, and more buyers, uh, particularly in Asia, will become more liquid. I mean, I, 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 because if you have a more liquid market, potentially you can swap supplies along uh, so that uh, you, you would do the trade that, that makes the most sense. Uh, one of the more interesting developments recently in the idea of uh, North American exports is this joint venture between Exxon and Gutter, uh, applying for a license to export gas from, from the United States. Now, why would Gutter be interested in exporting uh, uh, U.S. LNG? Because you have the swap opportunity so that you, you, just like you do with oil, where you can take advantage of transportation economics even though you you may be the, the seller, you can you can source that with someone else's gas. I think it's interesting that oil companies are more and more self-contracting for, for their LNG supplies, which which 
means that they believe that there's a future out there uh, that where they can do the arbitrage in, in, in the market, uh, just much like we, we do with oil to today. So I, I'm not sure the physical connection is so important um, because if, if you if you have Eastern Med gas, which I hope you will have very soon, uh, that that uh, you can swap a cargo with someone in East Africa and you can supply East Asia uh, and and you can supply their customers in Europe, maybe. Uh, so uh, I, I think this is the future for LNG that, that maybe we will see uh, if, if uh, uh, more market liquidity uh, appears. Just a, a, a note, I mean, for those of you who just gets esoteric very quickly when you talk about LNG, but just think, uh, U.S. gas prices are 280 a 1,000 cubic feet or whatever BTU, $2.80 or something like that today. Uh, it's eight to ten dollars in Europe at the national balancing point, uh, and it's set sixteen seventeen in Japan, Korea, and LNG for many years. This price differential is just absolutely staggering. It reflects transportation economics, but all kinds of other constraints uh, and liquidity. That's what it's talking about: liquidity in the marketplace to be able to get more movement and, and, and swapping and. Uh, the uh, spot market has become much larger over the last uh, decade. That's important. And then that Asian Japan crude cocktail natural gas linkage to oil prices is a, a big constraint because it's driving those $17 prices. Uh, so you have a huge underlying set of issues here about how and when will Asian gas price, LNG prices begin to reflect a more liquid uh, integrated global market for LNG because now it's just regional, very regional picture. I'd, I'd like to remind my Asian and, and European friends that just because we enjoy three dollar gas doesn't mean that you're going to get it at three dollars. We would try to sell it to you at sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that you have a lot more margin to work with, and and and, and that this is why liquidity and the narrowing of the three, the pricing of the three regional markets that LNG transportation allows you uh, to do where that becomes important. But as long as they stay with rigid long-term take-or-pay contracts, uh, uh, as long as they stick with oil indexation uh, and so on, the producers will continue to be very happily selling expensive gas to the consumer the consumer wants to pay for it. Uh, but, but will the consumer force producers um, that into doing something different with gas on gas competition. I, I think that's probably the issue of the next five, ten years. Gas on, comp gas on gas competition. That's what drove U.S. prices. You know, that's what created the U.S. market was when the pipeline system, common carriage, everything else allowed you to really have gas on gas competition. That's when prices came down. Uh, last, last one, I'm afraid. Thank you. Uh, I'm Daniel Lisson. I'm an independent consultant. And in the interest of full disclosure, I, I am under contract to Asian Development Bank right now. Um, a quick comment on the gas prices. That $3 gas in the United States is not going to be around for very long. Just maybe four or five years ago, we had $7 per million BTU in the hub. And I'd be surprised three or four years from now if we were still looking at $3 per million BTU in the United States. That would be pretty bad indicator of energy policy. But my question is on something that nobody mentioned. Three years ago, the G20 signed an accord to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. And where is that? Maybe Chandra could comment on where, where that initiative is and what, would be, what are the implications for possibly curtailing oil and gas demand growth in Asia, as well as global. Okay. Short answer is nowhere. <laughs> There's been a debate, a number of studies have been launched on to identify what these subsidies are, both on the producer side and the consumption side. And of course, in a complex study like this, you end up with multiple conclusions depending on the perceptions. So I don't think even the G7 plus one or whatever have any concrete conclusions on the subsidies. Uh, definitely the G20 does not have. That said, as I said, thanks to climate change negotiations, there have been pressures to increase uh, or decrease fossil fuel uh, 
waste energy. And that, I think, has had a much higher impact than the agreement to phase off uh, subsidies. The second big issue has been the budgetary pressures on the Asian nations themselves. So you saw in India increase its diesel price very sharply over the last few days, and that's because of budgetary pressure. Same thing has happened in Indonesia, in uh, uh, Malaysia, everywhere. So it's more to do with domestic budgetary pressures than to do with any international agreements that have driven down subsidies. Uh, we are uh, getting up against and past the, the deadline for delivering the panel on time and on under budget. It's <laughs> <laughs> no in the business. Uh, so I, I, as much as I enjoy the discussion, I think you all do too. We, we uh, have some special guests coming pretty soon. We need to take a, take a little break. But uh, I, I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists for what I thought was a great uh, set of uh, conversation, discussions, and answers. So, we thank you all for being here.